welcome to the video of support vector machine so what is svm it is a supervised machine learning mainly used for a classifier as a classifier so it works very well on data set which need non linear boundaries we'll see what it is it is considered one of the best classifiers so how does svm work let's look at it pictorially so you see this data you have uh, two classes in the data like the plus and uh, cross red cross and uh, then blue uh, triangles right so you see this data is all mixed up right these two classes they are all mixed up there you cannot draw a line or boundary you know you cannot draw a line or boundary uh, in this data so because some blues are here some crosses are here then again blues are here so you know they are all mixed up so to of course there are uh, other uh, machine learning techniques also but which can solve this problem however svm is considered to solve these kind of problems uh, more efficiently and with less calculation so see if we use uh, linear uh, you know classifiers they will not be able to do the proper job here they will draw a line here boundaries here so it won't work right we are not able to uh, divide the classes properly by using these straight lines so that is why we need a non linear uh, class classifier non linear boundaries basically one boundary here then another boundary perhaps here you know so this is how uh, it works and for that we need an efficient uh, uh, classifier and that's where support vector machine comes into picture so hyperplane before we move on to you know what is svm and try to understand the uh, mathematics behind it let's try to understand what is uh, a hyperplane so basically hyperplane is a subspace in a n dimensional space so let's say we have a 3d data so in 3d space the subspace space would be 2d uh, surface basically so that's why you know it is uh, if if n is the number of dimension in the space then a flat space which is n minus 1 dimensional flat space that is our hyperplane so what it does is it divides n dimensional space into two right because we need that if we want to like you know uh, differentiate between two classes we need some dividing factor so this is where this uh, this hyperplane comes into picture so remember that in in n dimensional space a hyperplane would be n minus 1 dimensional flat surface something like that in three dimension of course if the number of dimension keeps increasing uh, n minus 1 then it uh, will also keep increasing so it's very difficult to pictureize that so we will look at uh, one small example of like you know 2d so in 2d if uh, this is your uh, line right this is how you define line so this is let's say 2d and uh, uh, like y axis and x axis and there are two classes right these stars and these triangles so and they are clearly uh, you know uh, you know uh, they can be they have a clear uh, linear boundary right this using linear boundary we can divide this so that is advantage with this this is simple data so to understand what is hyperplane so now a hyperplane is like a flat uh, space, subspace right which has n minus 1 dimension so in 2d the dimension is 2 so what would be the sub, uh, dimension of sub, uh, hyperplane it would be 1d right n minus 1 2 minus 1 so then in that case it is a simple line so in 2d a hyper uh, plane is just a line just like this and you know how do we define line theta 0 plus theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 right these are two variables and these are coefficient this is your bias term so this line you see here this is hyperplane for this 2d data which is just a line so in 3d it is a flat 2d surface right then it will be a, a kind of this entire thing could be if it was a 3d data we are not able to visualize here so then this rectangle itself would become our hyperplane right so for n dimensional space uh, this is the line this is your hyper plane right so because for two dimensional it is uh, this line so for n dimensional the hyper uh, plane would be defined by this equation 
all x1, x2, xn, they're all different uh, variables or different dimensions in the data set. And these are coefficients, right? So all the data points satisfying the above equation will fall on the hyperplane. That means in this 2D, if you see, if all the data points which satisfy this equation, they will be basically on the line itself, on the line itself. They won't be this side or this side of the line. So in, in 3D, if this is the hyperplane, this then all the data points, if they satisfy this equation, all the data points will be on this surface, on this flat surface. So this is what it is. So any data point which is uh, which has the value of this equation greater than or less than zero, they will fall on this side of the hyperplane or that side of the hyperplane, right? They won't fall on the hyperplane itself. So then in that case, we can create, uh, define an equation, right? So y i, let's say y i is our response variable and the, it takes, it's a two class response variable. Either it takes plus one or minus one value, right? So then this should be greater than zero for all the correctly, uh, uh, you know, positioned uh, data points, right? So if y is negative value, that means y is minus one and this is negative value, right? That means let's say this side is negative and this side is positive. So all the data points will fall this side of the hyperplane, right? Because uh, they are either le less than zero, right? So this means this is a negative value and y i is negative value. That means they are correctly positioned. In case this is negative and this is positive, right? So, so what happens is negative, negative becomes positive, right? So whenever this equation is greater than zero, that means the data points have been classified uh, correctly, right? Or they are in the right side of their, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the right side, actually, not in the incorrect position. So if this star would have been here, then the value of this, this would have been less than zero. Why? because this side is positive so this equation is giving us positive value but y i is minus one right minus one because this side y the actual observed value of this y is the observed value and this is our calculated value right so if this is negative and this is positive that means uh, this one star which is this side is incorrectly positioned so that is what this equation tells us so the value when actual uh, value of the observed data and this equation if when multiplied and they, the value is greater than zero, that means they are correctly positioned in the right side. If if it is less than zero, then these are wrong side. So you can take both examples. If the y is plus and this is plus, it's greater than zero. Y is negative and this also negative, then also then also it's greater than zero, negative, negative, positive. I varies from one to m. M is the number of example. So what is maximal margin hyperplane, MMH? Let's see what it is. So we can have infinite number of of perfectly separated uh, data points right hyperplanes sorry so infinite number of hyperplanes right in this 2d data hyperplane is just a line we saw this in the example but i can we can also draw another line like this and this is also dividing these classes right i can draw another line here which is also able to divide these two classes properly and like this in this uh, rectangle itself we can draw infinite number of such lines so that means there are infinite number of possible hyperplanes right within this margin that gap so how to decide which is the best uh, of these three at least in this example which is the best hyperplane of uh, which which works most efficiently or most optimum uh, solution for this problem so this is this is where the maximal margin hyperplane comes so how do we define maximum uh, maximal margin hyperplane is uh, basically this is the most optimal hyperplane right that's what we discussed now so it selects the hyperplane farthest from all the data points, right? That means a, a hyperplane would be the one which will be farthest from all the data points from this side and this side in a, at every level, right? So that is one criterion, okay? So doesn't come in contact with any of the data points. So a, a hyperplane which does not touch any of the data points. So I can have a line like this, right? Touching these points. So uh, that won't be the right thing. So, so one hyperplane, which is farthest from all the data points. Another condition is that doesn't touch any of the data points. Okay. Then it calculates the perpendicular distance from all the data points. So like, the, so it will calculate the distance, perpendicular distance from this data point, then from this data point, from this, and also from the other side. 
So this is what it will calculate. That's how it calculates the distance. The smallest distance known as margin is minimal distance. So what happens is of all the distance that distances, let's say take the example of this uh, black one. So what we'll do is we'll calculate the high, uh, distance from each data point perpendicular distance, right? So which are the closest of all these data points of all this side also data points. These points are the closest, right? This these points are the closest. All the others are far from these two. So we will calculate the distance of the closest data points. We'll consider only those uh, data uh, dis, uh, data points which are closest to the hyperplane, right? So this is called minimal distance, right? We can do the same for this line also, and we can do the same for this line also. So like this line will have a different uh, minimal margin, right? That this line has a minimal distance margin, right? And this has a different minimal uh, distance or margin. This will have a uh, different uh, smallest distance, right? Minimal distance means the smallest distance what we are talking about. So the smallest distance for this line is only distance from these data points because they are the closest. For this also it could be this maybe or it, and this perhaps. For this line it could be this or or something else like you know. So so the thing is so we are just considering the smallest distance okay of all the hyperplanes and whichever hyperplane gives us the the lowest smallest distance uh, sorry largest smallest distance that becomes our uh, marginal maximal margin hyperplane. So remember among all the small distances you know whichever is the largest small distance that gives us the hyperplane which is most optimal and it is known as maximal margin hyperplane right so in this case we have selected this because so so for observations to the hyperplane right so this is the minimal distance for from the observations to the hyperplane so smallest distance known as margin is minimal distance from observations to the hyperplane so this see this this is the margin right this is the smaller dis distance right of all, uh, I mean the the closest data point from the closest data point and this side it is this so of all the three this hyperplane has the largest minimal distance and that's why this is selected as our hyperplane so maximal margin hyperplane has largest margin right so that means the idea of this uh, this model building or this learning is that we have to increase this this width actually or this width from this side and this width from this side so that is the whole idea right obviously we want to bifurcate two classes so the the wider the uh, gap between them the better it is right then it is more clear right it's so that's why we select a hyperplane which has got the largest minimal distance that means largest margin that's what it boils down to largest margin this may not give us largest margin this may not give us largest margin all the other option may not give us largest margin so we if we select this this gives us the largest margin the, the width is the maximum and that's why this becomes a hyperplane and it is known as i mean all the hyperplane but this becomes our maximal margin hyperplane so it is the middle line drawn in the widest possible space right so this is the space widest possible space and when you draw the middle line that is our maximal margin hyperplane so this the the the, lo the logic is to maximize this gap between the classes separating two classes right so again this is the equation now so instead of zero earlier we saw the zero right considering that hyperplane is very close to the points but we are maximizing this value so whatever the distance m is basically the margin width of the margin right so we want to just maximize this so our hyperplane should be designed in such a way that y i into this equation should be greater than or equal to m that is the width of the margin again at the same logic there it was zero here we have put another number m so the margin the width of the margin right so this equation should satisfy this and uh, maximum m is again the maximum maximize m right that's the whole idea is of this of this algorithm is to maximize the value of m that's what we are looking at right now and uh, these are the condition y i is a plus 1 minus 1 i goes from 1 to m m is the number of example and theta, so we are basically going to calculate thetas in such a way because that's what we are going to do right theta so that it maximizes the value of m 
and it should also satisfy this condition where p stands for number of predictors right so here n actually it should be so this is what it is n right so n p goes from 1 to n so we have total n number of predictors n number of variables so when you take each each uh, coefficient and square them and add them up they should be equal to 1 that is what functions so what is support vector you know so we we'll look at it so data point that are closest to maximum margin hyperplane so we have already come up with the, our maximum maximal margin hyperplane this is what it is so this distance you see right this distance that is the margin this side and this this side now of all these data points which are the closest they are the closest right and of all these which are the closest they are the closest right and if this is our margin so these dot point these points are falling on the edge of the margin right on the border lines of the margin so all these data points only two here and two here these data points are considered support vectors so these data points are equidistant from mh right so this distance and this distance have to be same they can't be different so they are equidistant right from both the sides right and uh, even these two are equidistant from the hyperplane these two are equidistant and even this gap and this gap because remember by definition our hyperplane has to be maximal margin hyperplane has to be in the middle of the gap right middle of the gap so so middle me means that all the data points falling on this line and this border only they will be considered as support vectors so they lie along the lines that determine the width of the margin right so this this line and this line they are determining the width of the margin so they are vectors in n dimensional space right of course here it is two dimensional so they are vectors after all these data points are individual vectors in the n n dimensional space right so and second thing is they support mmh as their movements will change mmh right because to calculate the maximal margin hyperplane what do we look at we look at the closest data points right closest distance right smallest distance these are the smallest distance right among all the hyperplanes whichever has got the largest uh, minimal distance that becomes our hyperplane right so the this hyperplane has been defined based on these points you understand in a way so if these data points are falling here then only this hyperplane will be positioned here if this, these data points were like here or here it might be somewhere else this hyperplane may shift so as you move the position of these support vectors the hyperplane itself changes it shifts its position or it goes somewhere else so that's why first of all they are vectors in the n dimensional space so they are called vectors now these the data points are also supporting the existence of this maximal margin hyperplane and therefore they are called they are supporters so that's why it is called support vectors these dot points are called support vectors because their movement will change the position of hyperplane and they are falling in the n dimensional space they are vectors that's why so these data points are called support vectors now mmh only depends on support vectors of course because that's how we define a hyperplane without the support vectors this has no existence so mmh doesn't get affected by other observation that's another beautiful thing about uh, this kind of uh, you know machine learning or logic because what happens is it minimizes our calculation right now since this hyperplane has been defined only based on these data points which are called support vectors and the position of this uh, hyperplane depends only on these uh, vectors therefore it doesn't care about these value these values and these observations because they are changing the position of these uh, data points will not affect the hyperplane so it's only concerned about these support vectors so support vector classifier what is that so we look at that so if there are non separable classes right we what we saw in the previous example is they are perfectly separable classes right if you see your one data point from here has come here now how do you how do you design a hyperplane you cannot try it. you cannot it will touch upon these uh, points right hyperplane should not touch upon these points so that's the problem in this data point one is here just because one is here then one data point is so close here right 
so for to solve this problem now maximal margin hyperplane is very strict when it comes to the position of this support vectors it it relies on support vector it doesn't allow any data point to come within the margin or cross to the other side of the hyperplane it doesn't allow so to solve that problem now if we have data points like this data set like this where the classes are non separable by just one line like that so then uh, there comes this support vector classifier to help this prop to solve this problem right so what it does is it uh, the sep separating hyperplane cannot exist right because of the position of this uh, classes in this manner so so therefore no solution for m is greater than 0 right we cannot come up with the equation with where m is greater than 0 if we we rely on the maximal margin hyperplane so what do we do then so we develop a hyperplane using soft margin so this is the example of soft margin what you're seeing here is what this does is it allows some of the data points to be placed in the incorrect side of the margin that means this one is the example of a data point placed in incorrect side of the margin which is inside the margin right but and it also allows the some of the data points to be placed in the incorrect side uh, of hyperplane that means this is incorrect side of the margin and this is the example of incorrect side of the hyperplane itself so it is on the other side of hyperplane although it should be should have been this side this is on this side in the right side but it is within the margin so this is called soft margin so that's why it uses this soft margin which allows certain errors like this so support vector classifier is a generalized version of mmh actually it is just like that but only thing is it makes some allowance for some error right so like few examples can be here uh, and like here you know so so maximum margin hyperplane it's a generalized version of that so it allows some observations to, uh, to be on the incorrect side of margin and as well as on hyperplane as we saw these two examples here right so here the equation changes a little bit the first part of the equation is same right and this as we saw it's the same only thing is we add one error factor here you know epsilon i 1 minus epsilon i so what is epsilon i now this uh, this should satisfy a condition like this if you sum so there is epsilon i for each example right we are running this for each example you see i1 i2 in so these are one example right if i is one so this first example so epsilon 1 is the this uh, it's called slack variable so this slack variable is is different for different examples so if you sum all the slack variables okay all the values of slack slack variable uh, i goes from 1 to m it should satisfy this condition where it, it is less than equal to c and c is a non negative tuning parameter right so and again the idea is to maximize m for the same equation here right theta 0 theta 1 theta m so this allows us actually and what is this epsilon i epsilon i basically lets us know that uh, the position of the of the you know these uh, these uh, data points actually you know and how much how much error is allowed right that c will decide because the, some of these have to be less than equal to c so c only decides how much error is allowed right and the value of c tells us the position of these uh, data points right so they are somewhere it is related to this so see if epsilon is equal to 0 then observations are on the correct side that means these observations therefore their epsilon e is i epsilon value is 0 for all these including the support vectors this all these data points if they are greater than 0 then the wrong side of the margin so for this one wrong side of the margin this is the example of wrong side of the margin so the epsilon value for this will be greater than 0 and if epsilon value is greater than 1 then wrong side of the hp that is hyperplane itself so this is the example this data should have been this side of the hyperplane but it is this side of that plane. so it is obvious right 1 minus 0 it becomes the original equation right so all correct right if it is uh, uh, greater than 0 right greater than 0 but uh, but less than 1 right less than 1 so if the value is is the is a positive value right again and uh, if it is greater than 1 then the value is negative here you understand so that's why it is wrong side of the hyperplane the total value of this side becomes negative so this data point has gone this side although 
if if it is le less than one and greater than zero, the the overall value of this is positive. So it is on the right side of the hyperplane, but is wrong side of the margin, right? That's what that's how we interpret it. So what is support vector machine, right? So we'll look at this example. You see, these are the the same example we saw in the in the earlier slide, where data points uh, the classes are all mixed up. They are not separable linearly. So it works well for non-linear boundaries, right? Here you don't have a line. Here you need one circle here and one circle here, perhaps one circle here and one circle here. So it's a non-linear boundary. We enlarge. So one way to do it is we enlarge the dimensionality of of the feature space, right? What we do is see this is a 2D data, right? So we can add some polynomial terms, right? Degree. So we increase the value, uh, the power of some of the variables. Like if it is x1, then we also add x1 square x2 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 plus x2 square you know so we increase we enlarge the dimensionality so now we have more dimension right instead of having two dimension here if we also add x square and y square then we have four dimensional data so that's what we do so we increase the that is uh, something that we use in other uh, regression other like logistic regression as well as in uh, linear regression as well right for polyn so we add polynomial terms so using higher order polynomial of the predictors right so we can take the square cube etc so in this like this x1 x1 square x x1 cube x2 x2 square x x x3 uh, you know x2 cube so like that we can do you know so when we square the predictors now we have two so instead of taking cubes we only stick to squares so then we have two n features right for each uh, variable each feature we have one more variable right which is the square of the original variable so then, they, then our equation turns into y i theta zero, then theta one one x i one, theta one two x i one square, right? So the same, uh, but the square. Like we, likewise, we go on for all the n variables, and then this equation remains the same. Just that we have increased the number of uh, dimension. That's all we have done to solve this non-linear linearity problem. And this y remains same plus minus one. I again goes from one to m. This is again the same. The sum of all the epsilon should be less than or equal to this tuning parameter. It's a non-negative number, right? And epsilon should be greater than and zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero. It is always a positive value, but a very small value. So again, this m is the width of the margin, and this this, this theta should satisfy. Now here, you know, we have two summation, right? Summation, right? Two because uh, j is going. So one is for the theta, like you know, all the the original one. Features and the second one is like you know this uh, j j is for one to two because we are taking square right if we have taken cube also one more then it would have been three here if we are taking the uh, power to the power of x to the power of four then then it would have been four here whatever like the power whatever p the power keeps increasing the polynomial keeps growing then we keep adding more uh, higher value here and this should satisfy again it should be equal to one. So again, the same equation follows there. Here also, epsilon is zero, so this becomes uh, one actually. So it remains one. So all the observations are on the correct side. The epsilon is greater than zero, then wrong side of the margin. The data point is on the wrong side of the margin. If epsilon value of the that example is greater than one, then wrong side of the hyperplane, as we saw earlier, right? So kernel functions. So one way is to uh, you know look at uh, this uh, classifier is to use the normal uh, you know the normal method where we calculate each coefficient and then we multiply with the variables and we keep adding them. So so there is something called in support vector is uh, you know uh, it it uses a function called kernel function. So we can have a linear kernel as well as non-linear kernel and we'll see how to use this kernel. How uh, support vector machine or support vector classifier uh, use you know these kernel functions. So this linear uh, kernel function is in a products of each pair of observations. So right now we are discussing a kernel functions what they are how. So for a linear uh, linearly uh, you know linear boundary between two classes, we use support vector classifier right. If the boundary is non-linear, the support vector classifier becomes support vector machine. So, so for support vector classifier, where the classes are, we are able to divide the classes using linear boundary. We need we use linear kernel function, 
and this linear kernel function is nothing but inner products of each pair of observations. So we take two two pairs of observations, right? So let's say uh, you know observation one and of xi xi and xj xj they represent two different pair two different uh, observations. So we take the the pair and we calculate the inner product, which is when you multiply and you know all their features and add them together. So this is what you get where P is P is 1 to n right n is the number of features so each observation will have n features right because we are dealing with n dimensional data data so each observation will have each example will have n dimension so we just multiply them the data points based on their features add them you know that is gives us that is what gives us the inner product right so i and j both are going to be 1 right 1 to m right because we are just creating pairs of uh, all the observations different pairs so i and j are going to be from 1 to m but if you want to do the vectorized uh, calculation of the same what you just you do is you x into x transpose which is m by n matrix x is x is m by n matrix and uh, if it is calculated in 2d it returns the cosine similarity basically so all these kernel functions are basically uh, they give us the similarity their similarity function they give us what is the similarity between two observations that is the purpose of all these uh, kernels basically so if if uh, inner product is one then both the uh, both the data points in a pair are completely similar and they are parallel okay if if the inner product is zero then they are completely dissimilar that means they are perpendicular to each other that's how we interpret it so for non linear kernel function so this was for linear uh, kernel right if, if the classes are we are able to di uh, divide the ca classes by a linear boundary then we use linear kernel but if you are not able to divide those classes like we saw in the example they are all mixed up then we need non-linear kernel function so there are examples of non-linear kernel function this is polynomial learning machine right so it's basically in a product only plus one bias term and we take the uh, the higher power of this you know so the power p is specified by the user right so it could be square or cube or whatever for p can vary from 2 to any number right other if it p is 1 then it, it reduces to this linear so we are turning this non linear kernel into non-linear and we just we raise it to higher powers right we take the polynomial basically that's what it does so then this is called uh, another option we have is it's called radial basis function Radial basis function, uh, if you look at the equation exponential of, you know, xi minus x, this is basically your, uh, your, your uh, uh, you know, the distance actually, basically, between the two Euclidean distance, right, between two data points, divided by 2 sigma square. So, if, if the value is, if the value of uh, this is, you know, 1, then both are same if the value are zero then both are completely different like just like perpendicular and parallel we saw here right and this function reminds us of a gaussian function right gaussian normal distribution so it is also known as gaussian kernel so it, it is uh, parameterized by this function is by sigma which determines how quickly the similarity values decrease to zero right so if if we have uh, you know very small value of this then the this value will go very high right this value will go very high and if they go very high then one by this large value will tend to zero right so this is what so how quickly this is like you know moving towards zero so and why should they move zero so basically if the examples are going apart from each other right so if they are far from each other that means distance is also increasing right between these two data points right Euclidean distance we are calculating here so if these two data points are very dissimilar they are very far apart from each other then the value will be very high and if this is low value then it will quickly move towards zero right so RBF is also known as Gaussian kernel as we saw so computing support vector machine right so we can denote all kernel functions as K you know, just for a conventional so support vector classifier machine is represented as so this is the actual function what we saw earlier was the conditions and all that and how to you know how to arrive at how to maximize the 
margin basically so this is the actual if you use those formula and you know if you uh, do the further calculation using certain equations mathematical equation you will arrive at this this uh, equation basically this is our support vector classifier or machine it boils down to this equation this is the bias term and alpha is for uh, is for each example of uh, of the data set right so i varies from 1 to m and k is the kernel function right basically it is for the pair right each pair in the data set and this kernel function k can either be linear or non linear so when ki is a linear kernel in a product fx is support vector classifier as we as we discussed earlier right so the difference between support vector classifier and machine is only this that if the data set or the classes are uh, able uh, we are able to differentiate the classes using linear boundaries then that is support vector classifier if there are no linear boundaries possible between classes because the way they are mixed up then we use non linear kernel function and then it is called support vector machine that's the only difference so when ki is a non linear kernel uh, we use rba for plm as we saw right so polynomial learning machine or radial based function so fx is support vector machine that's what we just now discuss so alpha is a parameter for each observation i so we are going to estimate alpha i and theta 0 that is the whole purpose and that will give us the support vector machine or support vector uh, classifier that's the purpose to calculate this estimate these two parameters so it turns out that uh, this alpha i takes non zero values only for support vectors remember we saw the this this thing right so these points which are falling on the margin line they are support vectors right and they define our hyperplane right so only so the so the width of this margin also depends only on these two parameters to uh, these observations sorry these support vectors so these support vectors only play the crucial role in or uh, the most important role in uh, you know support vector classifier or support vector uh, machine the idea is to increase this maximize this gap between classes and this depends on the data points which are falling on the margin lines you know borders which are called support vectors and this hyperplane so therefore but this when we do the calculation we realize that alpha i there is a mathematical calculation for that you know so which uh, which we cannot do it here if you want you can do some research online to know why it is happening this way why alpha i is taking non zero value only for the support vectors right you can do that some research so this alpha i takes non zero values only for these two uh, data points uh, sorry these two these support vectors these four points and for the rest of these values it takes zero value so this simplifies our equation right so that means we don't need to calculate you know this uh, do the calculation for all these data points right our calculation gets limited only to these support vectors and that's why the support vectors is also a great optimizer actually instead it doesn't follow that uh, greedy search uh, idea you know it works more on optimization problem so we are optimizing something here right so that's why it is it is uh, it is one of the best uh, classifiers we have among all the classifiers so all we need to calculate is a kernel function right so all if we do this properly then we do the uh, calculation of a kernel function and then we can estimate alpha i and theta 0 right of support vector so so what it means is all we need to do is we just need to calculate the this kernel function of the support vectors because our uh, algorithm doesn't care about these points right because for them alpha is zero alpha is non zero only for these points so we need to do the calculation for this kernel function only for this limited number of values which are our support vectors and the rest of the examples we can ignore so this is what the support vector machine and uh, uh, classifiers are now so far we have dealt only with uh, two classes right what if we have multi class uh, more than two classes in the data set so we need a multi class support vector machine right so there are two basic uh, uh, approaches to that you know which we can follow so one is called one versus one class so what we do is we construct k into k minus 1 by two classes k stands for the number of class if there are if the k is more than 
two only, right? If k k is equal to two, then what we saw in the earlier slides, that's what we do. But if k is more than two, is three, four, five, then we need to build in this approach one versus one class. We need to build k into k minus one by two number of subject uh, support vector machines, and each machine will compare only a pair of classes. It will work only on pair of classes. So if there are if there is uh, if there are like uh, three classes, how many pairs can we have? Let's say A, B, C. So we can have A, B, and A, C, and B, C, right? So we can have three pairs, right? In that case, so then it will work on those three pairs, right? And then, for example, if S, B, M, one in this case may compare class K minus one to class K minus two, right? One class is K. Total number of classes, are, let's say five. K minus one will be four, and K minus two will be three. So it will only compare the third and fourth class. That's all. SVM one, SVM two will do some other class comparison of other classes. So when we use the test observation to assign uh, a class to it, it, right? When a test observation is assigned to a particular class based on this model, how does it work actually? So what we do is we'll, we test, we use this test observation of each SVM, and we see which, which, uh, uh, you know. Uh, which uh, class has been assigned to this test observation by maximum uh, by most of the SVMs? So, if a test observation, let's say T1, has been assigned to K2 class by most of the SVMs, then this test observation belongs to K2. Out of let's say five SVMs, uh, three SVMs have assigned class. K minus two to this test observation, then this test observation belongs to K minus two because three out of five SBMs have assigned the same class to this. So that's how it works. Now there's another approach is called one versus all. So what do we do in this? We build only K uh, support vector machine, okay, and each time one of the K versus rest of the K minus one. So what it means is like if there are let's say five classes, right? So the fifth class or the first class will become our reference class, and the rest of the classes will be turned to zero. So the class one will be assigned one value, and the rest of the classes will become zero. You know that's how we do it, right? So or minus one, whatever works. You know, like one or minus one. So one class will be k. K becomes our reference point, reference class, and the rest of the k minus one classes. Will be like zero or or one. They'll put under one category, right? So all will be turned into zero or minus one, and this one. So this is how this works. And we'll repeat this process for each k. So we will have k into n parameters, right? For each class, we will have n n number of parameters for n number of uh, feature uh, features, right? N number of dimensions or n number of uh, predictors or independent variables. So n into k. Uh, variables we will have a matrix of variable we'll have uh, not variable sorry matrix of parameters or coefficients we'll have k into n so it will have n by k parameters right that's what we discuss so whichever gives highest value of this you know this equation test observation is assigned to that class right so basically we'll calculate for each class whatever parameter we have like you know so theta 0 theta 1 and this uh, is for class one, the k k one, you know this k is for class one. Then for class two, we go on like this, right? So for each class, we have that many parameters, n parameters. So then we calculate this equation. We get the value, whichever has got the maximum value, whichever class has got maximum value for this equation, uh, we will assign the test observation to that particular class. That's how it works. So let's look at uh, some sample codes for uh, support vector machine. So I've just created a random, you know, data set. Uh, set dot seed, as you know, is for reproducibility. So if you use this set dot seed as one and use all these codes, you will get the same results as I have got it on my slide. So x one r norm is a function to create, you know, random normal distribution. You know, so random normal distribution. So mean is two, standard deviation is one. And 100 such data points have created. So this is first variable and this second variable. I've just changed mean and uh, uh, standard deviation, and I've calculated the mean of uh, x1, mean of x2. 
and then we have created this uh, uh, this response variable using the function con if called if else so instead of writing if and else separately there is r provides this option where you can just write if else one line code you know so the condition output is that if x2 is greater than equal to mean of x2 and x and x1 is greater than uh, equal to mean of x1 if this condition is true then y will get the value of 1 if this condition is false then y gets the value of minus 1 so this is what so i've created uh, this this uh, very simple way to create uh, you know if and else is a very good uh, uh, useful uh, function in r so now to to create some randomization in like you know i this has mainly created the uh, not exactly a linear uh, boundary between two classes but i wanted to make it little more complex so i have i have just uh, you know changed some of the y's uh, from minus 1 to 1 you know we'll see when the we plot it we'll see so th this is the plot function uh, and uh, so what i've done is you know x2 x1 and then you know the shape of the point data points again inside i've used if else function just to give different colors to different classes so here is what we have uh, created you know like this is the plot you notice one thing that i put x2 in x axis and x1 in y axis and we will see why later you know so just try to understand so you know see the data is like this then like this so this class is like you know so these two classes are mixed up that's why i've added this point here so that the classes get mixed up and then we'll see how SPM performs on this this kind of data set where two classes are all mixed up, you know. Then they, so some is here, some are here, then some crosses are here, then blues and blues here triangles. So if you use some uh, linear regression or sorry, uh, you know, linear uh, classifier, they will just draw lines, and you can clearly see that we cannot use linear, uh, you know, uh, classifier to differentiate between two classes. So uh, this is a simple, uh, simple data set and uh, plot, and we'll see what, how we work with SVM on this data set. So, so I've just converted that uh, uh, data set into a matrix, and then uh, I have combined the, the, this x, this data which has x1, x2, and uh, the y that we created in a data frame. And uh, why as a factor? Why? Because we are using classifier. So SBM, if we don't convert this into a factor, the SBM will treat it as a numerical value. And it will, SBM function can create, uh, can be used uh, uh, for linear regression as well. So, uh, you know, so, but it is mainly used for classifier, as a classifier. So that's why we need to change this into a factor. So I've also given a simple, you know, uh, this code for if you want to, uh, you know, calculate your own dot product, inner dot product between two variables in a data set. So since this is a matrix containing both the data sets, so this is a vectorized version of that. So X, you know, matrix multiplication transpose X. So it will give you, what it will give you? It will give you M by, so this is M by N, right? And this becomes N by N. So N and get cancelled. So you'll get M by M. So 100, since there are 100 data points. So you'll get 100 by 100 matrix of inner product, right? For radial based function, uh, again, I've given a function here. You can use it, you know, if you want to. But here X1 and X2 are not, uh, uh, you know, they're different uh, observations, okay? It's not the complete matrix. So one observation will have two variables, another way, uh, way uh, vector will have two variables right there are two vectors actually so two data points two observations right and make sure when you're using this uh, formula you use you turn this x1 and x2 into a column vectors then only it'll work and there should be matrix because, because uh, you know otherwise this matrix operation won't work so you don't have to do all this actually you know when you're building a model in r or in any other language nowadays you have uh, frameworks you have different libraries you know, so SBM also offers that. So there is a library called E1071. Library means this is a package you can install on R, you know, uh, using install dot packages inside the bracket, you put this into, uh, you know, double quotation mark and it will install. And then once it is installed, then you need to use this function library. If you want to use any package in R, 
and if it is already installed then you use this function library it will uh, bring that up for you and then all the functions in that package you can use so it has a function svm right for svm support vector machine so what i've done is like you know this is more like linear regression only this is your response variable right minus one and one tilde dot means all the variables in x all the independent variables in x right so this is the data right and this is kernel because this is non non linear separate no the the data points are not separable separable linearly right so for such non separable data points classes we need to use non linear uh, kernel right so i'm using radial that we saw in the previous slides false means scale false means we don't want the data this svm to you know normalize our data into you know like like we used we saw right in the previous uh, videos where we normalize or standardize data right we don't want that to happen here if you want you can do you can turn this into true depending on your uh, problem that you're trying to solve right here i have not used that so i don't want to scale my data i want to use them in their original form so this is uh, fitted is uh, basically a function for all the predicted value of it's not for the new data but the data that we have already used right so this will this model is going to predict the uh, y from the same data so you can use fitted or you can also use predict and if you are using predict then you have to supply this model here and comma and then new data and new data could be your test data or the same data but if you just use fitted then it will give you the predicted value of the same data so then we see the table you know we use table to see how our model has performed on the data set so this is the original uh, response variable this is predicted value right so you see this is minus 1 this is the uh, predicted value and see so minus 1 minus 1 you know you can see that uh, 47 uh, have been Uh, predicted correctly by the model and this is again uh, 45 one classes classes class 1 have been predicted correctly right 1 and 1 but 4 here and 4 here so total 8 have been misclassified actually so in a way the model has performed really well you know i mean uh, so there's 92% accuracy of course the data itself is random that i've created moreover we have provided less number of data if you provide more it will it will do better but still it is giving us uh, like you know 92% accuracy if you see so plot is here uh, so this is the fun if you can you, what you can do is uh, if you want to plot uh, you know this uh, how the classifier has performed so what you do is m1 is your uh, model that you built and data is the data original data in the plot function it will plot we'll see that in the we'll see the plot in the next slide you know we'll do the comparison with the original data and the in this plotted one and this is summary right summary function uh, if you use summary inside the bracket you put place this name it will give you the summary of the model that is built right so this is a formula right we use the formula here and uh, SVM type is classification, right? It's not regression. SVM kernel is radial. That's what we provided. Cost is one, and the number of support vectors is 57. So there are 57 support vectors, 29, 28. Maybe the one, the class one is plus perhaps 29, and the second class is 28. That's what it is. So number of classes two, right? Levels minus one and one. That's that's what we provided. So let's look at the comparison between the you know the original data is plotted like this right this is what we saw right and uh, this is uh, the SVM so that's the reason why I I put x1 on y axis and x2 on x axis because SVM function does the same thing when you plot SVM model you know it does that it first variable is on the y axis and second variable on the x axis that's why to compare compare we have to do this. so you see this here the points are not the classes it's not the the shape of the these data points does not represent class in this plot it is the shade so the the darker shade this purple color is one class and this lighter shade is another class that's all that's all that's how you have to see it don't get confused by the shape of these data points basically crosses means they are support vectors and the circles are normal observations okay so wherever you see crosses they are support vectors actually and wherever you see the circles they are basically the normal observations they are not support vectors so some of the data points have been misclassified in this region you see 
all these you see the different color right this purple color has come here right so that these are misclassified uh, data point this is misclassified in this region these these black ones you know they are misclassified right here so there were i think eight misclassified right? one two three then four five six right seven and perhaps it has also considered uh, one of these perhaps one of these eight so there are eight misclassified right data points so this is how we see this you know this is how it works so you can try these uh, at your own, at your end you know like and see if it it works well you can uh, you can also use different data sets if you like you can generate your own random data sets and see how it works you know it's a very good uh, classifier and it works on most complicated data sets as well we have only seen the, the simple data set with two variables you can try this with many other variables also you know so thank you so much for your patience and if you like this video like share and subscribe